have to do. Now, let's read Revelation 1.15. And we're going to rest on that for the amount of time we have left. Revelation 1.15 says this. It talks about Jesus here. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, <coughs> and his voice as the sound of many waters. Amen? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you once again for a time that we can come to you and worship you <coughs> with freedom. Lord, we don't take that lightly because in a lot of other countries, Lord, they can't do that. Right. And Father, at times we, so many, take that lightly. So Lord, we ask that you would be with us in this word today. Be with us, Lord, and anoint it. <clears throat> Help us to understand what your spirit is saying today, Father. And help us to come alive Lord, and be excited for you. Help us to implement these words in our life and rejoice with it in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Now as we look in the first part of this verse, it speaks of the feet of Jesus being like fine brass as refined in a furnace. And this speaks of divine judgment and Jesus being our judge. Mm -hmm. We've seen in the early part of Revelation where Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega. He was making equality with God the Father. So we've seen him as God. We talked about that Jesus is also our high priest. Well, so we've seen him as God. We see him as our high priest. Now we're going to see him as our judge. Jesus is our judge. And when we talk about his feet, feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace. It does speak about divine judgment and Jesus being our judge. He himself walked through the fire, through his life and death and in the things that he suffered. How many know Jesus suffered in this life? Amen. He did. And that was a fire to him. And a fire has a tendency, if you look at when gold is refined or something else is refined, the dross or the dirty parts of that compound come to the top so the person can skim it off and what you have left is a purity. That's what happens when we go through a fire. Except with Jesus, he never had any sin. Amen? But he went through the fire for us. Amen. He went through the fire and he suffered many things in this life. And even in his death, it was a horrible death that he suffered. Now there are times that we as Christians have to go through the fire. And it's not always easy. But how many know that even in our lives, we got a lot of dross? There's a lot of things in our lives that don't belong there at times. Just drive down the road and let one of the drivers tick you off. <laughs> what do you do? Um, sometimes wrong words come out of our mouth. Sometimes we chase them in our cars. Sometimes we blow our horns at them, whatever it may be. Isn't that so? Yes. And we don't always ask, act Christ like do. Dross. That's dross. That's dross. And we shouldn't make excuses for it. We know when we do things wrong. We know when we say things wrong. We know when we think things that are wrong. And sometimes we have to allow the Lord to take that dross off us. Amen? Amen? Who better can be our judge than the one who had no sin? And he was without spot or wrinkle. He went through the fire, yet he was found. 
with no dross, no sin. See, everyone is people in this world who face one of two types of judgment. The first one is called penal judgment. Uh, penal judgment is criminal, a criminal judgment. It means judgment of conviction of a crime. The penal judgment of God is a conviction of one who has rejected Christ. We will face one or of two judgments when we face Christ. We will face Christ one day when we leave this world. The Bible says every knee will bow mm -hmm. and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Mm -hmm. You can run from Him here, but you will face Him. That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. You will face Him. And we will face one of two judgments. The first one is the penal judgment. It's a criminal judgment. <clears throat> and many will face the penal judgment of God. The Bible says that broad is the way. And many there follow that path to destruction. Well, you know, so and so does this. I had somebody say to me the other day, I was talking to them about their lifestyle and things that they were doing, and the person says to me, well, you mean because there are, are thousands or millions that think the same way I do, they're all wrong? I said, if it's the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. Okay. But broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there. Follow. Therefore, follow it. Don't they? And I'm talking about broad as the path that rejected Christ. They will face a penal judgment. And many will face a penal judgment of God. That ju judgment, though, is eradicated when one accepts Christ as Savior. You don't have to face a penal judgment. It's eradicated when we accept Christ as a Savior. And why is that? Because Jesus made a penal substitution for us. In other words, Jesus died a violent substitutionary uh, uh, death to be a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of both Gentiles and Jews. He paid the price so we didn't have to. And we don't have to. Amen. And what does that mean for us? Once we accept Christ, we accept His substitution death for ourselves. Never again will we have to worry about penal judgment unless we fall away from Christ and live like a heathen again. You won't have to. Now there's a second type of judgment that we will face, and everyone, even Christians, will face this, and that is a parental judgment. How many know that we become sons and daughters of God when we accept Him? Amen? Amen. Amen. But it doesn't really get us off the hook, because we still do things in this body, times that are good and times that may not be so good in this life, right? Amen. And as Christians, we will all stand before Christ and give an account of what we've done in this body. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It's called the Bema Seat of Christ. He's the judge. That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So whether it's good deeds or bad, we will be judged for it. Our works will either glorify Christ while we're here as Christians in the body. Our works will either glorify Him or we'll glorify ourselves. Who are we glorifying today? Amen? Amen. Who are we glorifying today? If your life is just all about you, then guess what? 
We're probably not glorifying Christ, are we? What are our lives about today? In 1 Corinthians 3.11 through 15, it says this, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is our foundation. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it. Let me tell you something, people out there right now. This is for some of you that have said that. Don't ever think that so-and-so will get away with what they're doing. Right. Some of you have said, how come they can get away with that? Let me tell you something, it will catch up. It's going to catch up. And one day, whether it be here or in the next life to come, they will have to answer for it. Amen? Well, that's loud. <laughs> what are you doing over there? I'm just talking to her. Keep her woke. It's coming out. I'm sorry, you guys. Right. So each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. There's that fire again. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Amen? The fire is God's judgment. He will see through all the intents and the facades we put on in this life. He will go right to the heart of the matter and see if our works glorify him or if our works glorify us. What are we doing things for? Are we really glorifying him or are we glorifying us? If it's us, we will lose our rewards, but we will still be saved. Remember, this is parental judgment. Penal judgment has been taken care of at the cross. Once you're saved, you're fine. But there's still a parental judgment on what we do in this body here. And I should say, once you're saved, you're fine unless you turn from Christ, reject Him again, and live like a heathen. I, I, you're on thin ice there. I didn't go to go that way. Thank But we will still be saved. And why? Because we have moved from penal to parental judgment. Why is it important to know the difference between these two? Penal and parental judgment. Because the devil likes to make us think parental judgment is penal. God may bring conviction on us for something that we may be doing. But he doesn't condemn us. The devil wants you to feel condemned over things that we have done. But Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. Amen. And the devil would like you to think that you are so bad and you've done things so wrong that there is no hope for you. So you may as well give up, stop trying. And go another way. And Christ is saying to you today, no, 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 no. Just turn to me. Ask for my forgiveness. Is, and I'll set you back on the path again. The disciple came to Jesus and said, how many times did I got to forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus said, 70 times seven. In other words, as much as it takes. Yeah. Yep. Jesus is all about forgiveness. Not condemn, condemnation. Condemnation and condemning. Amen? You bet. He wants to give you another chance today. Amen. Take the chance. If he's speaking to your heart right now, take the chance. He wants to give you that chance. He forgives his children. He doesn't condemn them. Amen? He forgives his children. He doesn't 
condemn them. So again, we see three facts about Jesus so far in Revelation. Jesus is our God in Revelation 1.8. He is our great high priest, Revelation 1.13. He is our judge, Revelation uh, high priest, uh, yeah, Revelation 1.15. He's our judge. Now if we look at the rest of verse 15, it states this, and I'm going to read the whole thing again. His feet were like fine brass if refined in a furnace. His voice is a sound of many waters. Well, what does that mean? His voice, like the sound of many waters. Can you imagine all the oceans put together and all the waves coming in and hearing the sounds of all the waves? What, that, what would that sound like to you? Very loud. Very loud. It would sound powerful, wouldn't it? Yes. yes. It would sound like, uh, have a sound of authority, wouldn't it? Yeah. You couldn't hold it back, could you? No. No. His voice is like the sound of many waters. When the voice of, uh, of Jesus was described here as the sound of many water, waters, it speaks of a voice of power and authority. Like waves of an ocean, all the waves put together. I remember my friend Rock who had his death experience and saw Jesus. He was round, wandering, wandering around up there doing what he was doing and the minute the Lord spoke his voice, Rock, he found himself in front of Jesus immediately. Split second, boom, he's there. But all the Lord had to do was speak his name. That's the power of his voice. The authority of his voice. When he speaks, things happen. Amen? Amen. When he speaks, things happen. Amen. We see the power and authority of his voice when he spoke everything into existence. At creation. John 1, 1 through 3 says, uh, says that in the beginning was the word. Who was the Word? Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. Everything you see that was made here on, on earth, in the heavens, everything, He's made it all. When God spoke, it was created. It, was, it existed. Oh, man is trying to refute that with the Big Bang. Oh, the Big Bang. <laughs> There's never been another Big Bang. <laughs> yeah, it's been millions and millions of years. And you, Darwin, and the Big Bang. And yet another one, nothing. Another Big Bang has never occurred anywhere. <laughs> if there was a Big Bang, God created that Big Bang. <laughs> Somebody banged the drum, right? <laughs> but when he spoke, things happened. We see the power and authority of his voice when, when uh, he will raise everyone from the dead in the rapture. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. He descended. It says the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel, and the dead will come alive. Those dead bodies will rise up. Those that are still alive will go with them and they'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. When he speaks, things happen. There's power and authority in his voice. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> and then we see the power and authority of his voice over all. Creation. In Ephesians 19, 
through 22 it says, And what is the exceedingly greatness of his power towards us, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which, talking about God here, which he worked, the Father, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above. Now just think about this. This is where Christ is seated in the heavenly realms. He's far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also Whoa. in the that Whoa. which is to come. And he will put all things under his feet and give him to be head over things to the church. Christ is over all. Amen? Amen? And we see the power and authority of his voice being over everything. Every principality, power, dominion. Everything. Not only in this age, but every age to come. I can't say enough about the power and authority of Christ. His name is above and over everyone and everything. And because it is, we can operate in that authority here on the earth as Christians. You can operate in that same authority. There is nothing that is above us because we are seated with Him in those same heavenly places. It says that in Ephesians 2, 5 and 6. It says, even when we were dead in trespasses, meaning us, made us alive together with Christ by the grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. So as Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father, we are sitting at the right hand of Christ in those same heavenly places. And because He is the head of the church, and we are the body, He transfers that authority on our lives. Amen. Yet many of us don't live that way. We live like underlings. We do. And because we are seated with Him in Christ Jesus, the devil has no authority over us. The devil has no authority over you unless you give it to him. That's the truth. And I prove this in Acts chapter 19, 13 through 16. And it's about some of the Jewish people back then. They were exorcists, trying to cast out demons out of people. Yet they had no idea who Christ was. And it says, then some of the itinerant or traveling Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jew by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. <laughs> wow. They didn't have it. They didn't have him. And also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, <laughs> and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> Let me tell you something. The devil takes note of those that know Christ. That's right. He's very aware of one who gives their life to Christ. And he's threatened by that. Because he knows that if these who come to know Christ ever figure out the authority and the power they have through Christ, his kingdom is in trouble. But the problem is, 
many of us as Christians, we don't understand the authority that we have. But he says, well, who are you? You seven sons of Sceva and high priest. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are telling me i got to get out of this place? By the one who Paul preaches about. I know who Jesus is. I know who Paul is. But who in the heck are you? <laughs> Man, come on. I am going to kick your butt right now. <laughs> I know those demons are strong. They're not weak. Don't play with a demon. Mind you don't know what you're doing. Leave them alone. That's right. Mm -hmm. So then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them. Overpowered them. And prevailed against them. Seven sons of Sceva, they could not hold this one man down. He became so strong because he was possessed with that spirit. Prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. <laughs> that spirit beat the heck out of them. But let me tell you something. That wouldn't have happened if one came in there who actually knew Christ and knew his authority or her authority in Christ Jesus. That wouldn't have happened. You see, these three Jewish young traveling exorcists didn't have the authority of Christ's voice within them. What do I mean by that? When we know Christ is our Savior, we have His authority. The devil knows who are the Lord's, as I just said. So when we speak and wield His authority, it's in a sense like the Lord's voice is speaking through us. Understand that. When I command healing to come in somebody, it's by His authority that He gives me, gives me, not mine. In myself, I can do nothing, but it's only through His authority Amen. and power that I can speak, and it's like His voice speaking through me. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Christ has given us the authority to walk above and not below. The power of the enemy. How many of us have been walking below the power of the enemy? Because we have not been exercising the authority that God has given us. He wants us to walk above, not below. He wants us to be the head, not the tail. Amen. Amen. Stop acting like the tail. Amen. Jesus told the 72 this when they returned and were amazed that even the spirits had to obey them. Even the devils are obeying us. You sent us out and we commanded the devils to go and they left. They had to go. When they spoke. Luke 10, 19, 20 says, Behold, I give you the authority. I give you, just as Jesus, here it is. I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means will hurt you or hurt you. And he says, I nevertheless do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. You're not subject to the spirits. The, subjects, the spirits are subject to you when you know Christ. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Is your name written in heaven today? Then you can have that authority in Christ. You don't have to be subject to the devil. 
But as Jesus told the 72, I'll give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He will give you that power Amen. to rise up and to walk above. Amen. Not below. Are you tired of being trampled on today? Are you tired of it? Yes. Then it's time to rise above and stay above. Amen? Amen. It's time to apply what we're learning here today. And not throwing it over our shoulder. Well, well, well. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I can say that. <laughs> I won't say nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Today, I believe He gives us that same power, people of God, that power and authority. It's His voice speaking through us when we wield His authority. Know that you are the head and not the tail. Know that you are to trample on and not to be trampled over. Use His authority and speak His word. And when you do, the spirits will know who you are, just like they knew who Jesus was and who Paul was. You become one of them through Christ. Amen? Amen? They will recognize His authority in you. They will know that they will not be able to leap on you like they did with the sons of Sceva. They won't be able to overpower you like they did with the sons of Sceva. And they won't be able to prevail against you like they did with the sons of Sceva. And in the end, they will have to flee the house, not you. Amen? Amen? So today, we have learned that Jesus is our judge and our authority. Through verse 15 of Revelation. We learn the difference between penal and parental judgment. Take it with you. As a child of God, you cannot be condemned. If you're feeling condemned, it's the devil playing with your head. Yeah. Alright? Yeah. I'm just going to say it for what it is. If you don't know Christ, well, okay. Time to come to know Him. We also learn about the power and authority of his voice. Let's walk in these truths so the devil can't deceive us any longer. Amen? Amen. And this is another way how we stay free in 23. <laughs> Amen? That's right. That's right. That's prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word today. Your word is life. Your word is freedom, God. I don't know what we would do without it, Father. Your, your word is power and authority, God. I ask God that these truths would stay with your people. And if there is one here today that doesn't know you as Savior, or would even want to turn their life back over to you because they walked away for some reason, let it be this day they can do that. Yes. Father, bless these people. And if we have any Christians that have not been operating in the power and authority, your power and authority, to walk above, but we're always being trampled by the devil for some reason, okay. help them begin to turn this around and understand your power and authority that you have given them. Yes. Bless your people, I ask, in the name of Jesus. Let them go out rejoicing and strengthen this day by your message, I pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.